Hello and welcome to Arcadia University's BI 327 uh, Histology course lecture series on the digestive system. And in part one of these lectures, we're going to look at general characteristics associated with the uh, digestive system. As with all of these lectures, uh, please review the objectives uh, for these lectures for these topics as we go through and help you to indicate uh, and determine what are the important concepts associated with this lecture as well as providing you with a collection of study focusing questions that you can use to learn the materials. So basically, uh, when we take a look at the digestive system, to start out with, we'll, we'll look at some general functions associated with this. And so the digestive system, again, because of uh, definition, uh, is going to be involved with uh, digestion of food particles. And so basically what we've got with the digestive system as its primary function is going to be uh, the processing and the bringing in of food particles to be used by the body, the cells of the body, as both an energy source as well as raw material. And if we take a look at this, the, the process of digestion is going to be the breakdown of food particles and it's going to be involving both the physical or mechanical breakdown of food and so essentially bringing something into your mouth into your oral cavity grinding it up with your teeth essentially taking a large kind of piece of food and then breaking it down grinding it down into smaller and smaller pieces that's physical breakdown we're also going to have chemical breakdown and we're going to be going through and in essence using chemicals, using enzymes, using acids to break down these foods that have been kind of ground up by that physical breakdown, the mechanical breakdown. We're going to take that chemical process, enzymes, acids, other things, and we're going to break these food particles down to their smallest unit. Since you break these polymers, we're talking about a protein, take the protein, the uh, chain of amino acids, and break it down into individual amino acids. If we're looking at a complex sugar, we're going to break it down into individual sugar monomers, individual units of glucose or uh, uh, fructose or things like that. Now, the process of digestion, again, is going to be the breakdown of the food particles. And so we're bringing in food from the outside world. It's passing through our digestive tract. Essentially, it's a, a tubular series of organs. They're going to run from the mouth opening to the anal opening. But from a physiological standpoint, the inside of the digestive tract is equivalent to outside of the body. Again, it's continuous to the outer surface of the body. And so just simply ingesting food, putting it in our mouth, chewing it up, swallowing it, isn't enough for bringing these food particles into the body, into the region where the cells can use that as both an energy source and raw materials. So complementing the process of digestion is also going to be absorption. And what we're going to do in the process of absorption is, in essence, take these materials that are passing down through the tubular organs of our digestive tract, take them from the lumen of the digestive tract, which is physiologically equivalent to the outside world, bring it into the lumen, bring it from the lumen across the epithelial lining, again, because we're going to be lined by a, an epithelium in these regions, but essentially bring it into the body proper, bring it into the biological structures associated with the living regions of your body. And so that process of absorption then is going to be occurring primarily within the small intestine, where we're going to be absorbing nutrients as well as water, as well as within the large intestine, where we're going to be absorbing uh, water, which has been added to the digestive system along the way. So in addition to the process of digestion and absorption, there are a number of other functions associated with the digestive system. The first of these are going to be excretion. Now excretion, if we want to think about it in a very basic sense, is going to be eliminating those undigested materials from the digestive tract. And so we're going to generate feces, which are going to be the, the, the food process, the food particles that have been processed Throughout the digestive system, hopefully the nutrients have been reabsorbed, have been absorbed, water's been reabsorbed, and we're going to have the waste material, which is going to be eliminated at the end of this tract. But we're also going to have a lot of metabolic waste uh, that are excreted from the liver and bile. And so uh, breakdown products uh, that are used throughout the body are going to be eliminated from the body in the liver. They're going to be packaged within the bile. The bile, which 
which is going to have some properties we're going to talk about later on in the series of lecture, is going to be added to the materials in the digestive tract to uh, help process uh, the digestion of lipids, fats and lipids, but in, among that are also going to be these metabolic weeds. So we're going to get rid of waste materials in the digestive system. The digestive system is also going to have a, a lot of self-regulation. And again, this is an idea that the body wants to be as efficient as possible. And so what it wants to do is the digestive system wants to do the process of digestion and absorption when food materials are within the lumen of the digestive tract. And so what we're going to be doing is regulating the digestive tract by structures within the wall of the digestive system, which are going to allow them to essentially respond to what's within the lumen in that region. And so we're going to have endocrine control of this. So we're going to have what are called intro-endocrine cells. Intro because they're going to be found within the walls of the digestive system. But essentially hormone secreting cells within the wall of the digestive system, they're going to respond to what's within the lumen. They're going to respond to acidity. They're going to respond to the presence of materials that are being digested. And in essence, these cells, these intro-endocrine cells, are going to secrete the hormones. The hormones are going to diffuse away and they're going to trigger the release of secretions from other things like the pancreas, which are going to be releasing uh, digestive enzymes. Uh, they may affect gut motility, so they may affect uh, the activation of the smooth muscle cells within the walls of the digestive tract to allow the, the churning and the movement of materials within the digestive tract itself. And so that's going to be an endocrine mode of control, still with this self-regulation process. We're also going to have innervation. And so we're going to have two nerve plexes, uh, autonomic nerve plexes, uh, where we're going to have cell bodies that are going to be located either in the submucosal plexus, under, underneath a region called the submucosa, or the myenteric plexus, where we're essentially going to have um, these autonomic nerve cells that are going to be found within the smooth, in between the layers of smooth muscle within the walls of the digestive tract. And again, this is gonna allow the, the digestive tract to respond to what's going on within the lumen. Additional function associated with the digestive system is protection. Now, if we think about what's occurring, the insides of the digestive tract are physiologically the equivalent of the outside world. And so we're moving materials into our bodies, in essence, passing them through our bodies, through our digestive tract. And so we're going to have a very extensive uh, absorptive surface that's going to be present within, especially within our intestines, because we want to be able to absorb the materials that we're digesting uh, and bringing in as food particles. But this is going to give us a very high risk of infection. So if we take a look at what's going to be occurring within our digestive system, we're going to see uh, protective mechanisms in place. We're going to have, in many regions of our digestive system, a mucus covering of the epithelium. This is going to give us almost like that slime coat that we talked about in other regions of the body, which is going to lubricate the surface of the body. It's going to protect the, the epithelial lining within our digestive system. The epithelial cells are going to have lots of tight junctions, which again are going to prevent things from squeezing between the cells and passing from the lumen into the underlying connective tissue in essence, getting into the body proper. Because what happens is, in order to come through the epithelial lining, it's going to have to pass through the cells. If we look in the connective tissue underlying the epithelia throughout the digestive system, we're going to see lots of plasma cells and lots of lymphocytes, small lymphocytes like we talked about in the previous lecture. They're going to be moving through this area and looking for pathogenic materials, uh, disease-causing materials, and plasma cells that can produce antibodies to the materials that are in the area and could be causing uh, potential diseases. If we look at the uh, factors that are released into the digestive system itself, things like lysozymes and digestive enzymes and acids are all going to be factors that are going to make for a very inhospitable environment for bacteria. You know, the acids and the digestive enzymes are going to be breaking down the food particles. They're also going to be breaking down the materials within the lumen. Lysozymes are specific antibacterial enzymes, which are going to be released in this area, which are, again, going to be involved with trying to protect the body from potentially harmful agents that are being ingested. If we take a look at the overall wall structure of the digestive system, 
What we're going to see is similar to other tubular organs that we've talked about previously in the course. We're going to have distinct layers. And so each of these layers is going to have uh, both anatomical and physiological characteristics. They're going to allow them to essentially function within the digestive system. Okay, so if we start at the lumen, start at the space, uh, the inside of the digestive tract, the wall structure is going to be lined by a mucosa. And so what we're going to see is going to be an epithelium, again, lining all the spaces in the body like we've seen in other areas. Uh, the epithelium may change based on the region of the uh, digestive tract that we're looking at, but it's always going to be present. There's always going to be an epithelium. Underlying that is going to be a lamina propria. Lamina propria is going to be a loose connective tissue, often very cellular. It's going to be a very fine connective tissue, but we're going to see lots of cells within this region, lots of small lymphocytes, lots of plasma cells. And then we're also going to have, at the bottom of the lamina propria, a muscularis mucosa. Uh, a layer of smooth muscle cells that are going to be present because these are going to be able to contract and essentially bring the mucosa into closer contact with the epithelium, uh, I'm sorry, the, bring the mucosa, the epithelial lining, into closer contact with the materials within the lumen. Now underlying the mucosa, essentially underneath this muscularis mucosa, is going to be the submucosa, submucosa for under the mucosa. This is going to be a more dense, irregular connective tissue, and this is going to be the location for the submucosal nerve plexus. And again, this is going to be in that location that's kind of outlined on the, the diagram to the right, where it's essentially in two. It's between the, the dotted, essentially the, the black dots. So it's between, um, <coughs> uh, between the mucosa and the underlying region. That underlying region is going to be called the muscularis externa. Now, the muscularis externa is going to be primarily smooth muscle, and it's going to be smooth muscle throughout most of the digestive tract in two distinct layers. It's going to have an inner circular layer, and that inner circular layer, the smooth muscle cells are going to be wrapped circumferentially around the lumen, and an outer longitudinal layer, and in the outer longitudinal layer, the smooth muscle cells are going to be running lengthwise, longitudinally, along the length of these tube-like organs. Now, in many regions of the digestive tract, we're going to have the myenteric nerve plexus, essentially an autonomic nerve plexus, so uh, we can find uh, autonomic nerve cells sitting between that boundary. And these cells, again, are going to be involved with regulating uh, the activity of the muscularis externa and essentially regulating the process of peristalsis. And then external to that, so basically external to three, we're going to have layer four, which is going to be either a serosa or an adventitia. Again, so we're going to have an outer connective tissue covering outside of the wall structure. Now the serosa, essentially outside of the muscularis externa, we're going to have some loose connective tissue, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, loose con layer of connective tissue, and then lined by a simple squamous epithelium. We're going to end up with a nice smooth surface along the epithelial lining. And again, you'll find the serosa along the free surfaces of the digestive tract, where the organs are going to be able to move in relationship to one another. And you want them to be very smooth so they don't stick to one another. We're going to have an adventitia, essentially as a replacement for the serosa, outside of the muscularis externa as a more dense, irregular connective tissue where the structure is going to be anchored to either retroperitoneally into the back of the body uh, cavity, or where we have two organs that are attached to one another. So a serosa, a nice smooth surface, a free surface, the adventitia, connective tissue, connecting it to either the body wall or other organs. And this is going to finish up uh, our first of these many lectures associated with the digestive system. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu. Thanks, and I'll see you in part two of these lecture series.